In light of the phenomenon that is Game of Thrones, it's interesting to return to the history that inspires the story, and even more than the facts, to try to uncover the messages, themes, and lessons that might be learned and repeated from history. Never forget what you are. The rest of the world will not. Wear it like armor, and it can never be used to hurt you. This history gives us models for rulers like Daenerys or Cersei, and shows how their leadership styles panned out in reality, which offers some compelling predictions for how they'll ultimately fare in the Game of Thrones. The show is about who wants power, and probably more than anything else, it's about what power costs people. And the history teaches us that power corrupts, destroys friendships and families, and makes the highest members of society live their lives in the shadow of fear. The pseudo-medieval setting of Game of Thrones makes us think of honor and chivalry, romantic yet tragic endings, and a violent society. As many fans know, the English Wars of the Roses in the late 15th century are the show's biggest historical influence. The conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters echoes the long-standing battle between two noble families, Lancaster and York. The name Wars of the Roses comes from the fact that William Shakespeare and others have written that Lancaster used a red rose as an emblem and York a white rose. In the first few seasons, the Lannisters are much like the victorious Lancastrians. The Starks are like the Yorkists, many of whom were killed. The names even sound similar. Lannister, Lancaster, and Stark, York and the family's respective emblem colors are also similar. Another name for the Wars of the Roses was the Cousins Wars, since the noble families were related. And the brutal and tragic deaths in Game of Thrones aren't just for ratings or excitement, they highlight the gruesome realities of these historical wars, like the Wars of the Roses, in which families might find themselves suddenly hunted or nearly wiped out. Martin's hardly the first writer to take inspiration from these wars, Shakespeare used them as loose material for some of his most notable histories. And looking closer at the Wars of the Roses, we can see all of the themes that Shakespeare found so dramatic. Ambition, betrayal, and family members battling each other to the death. It's striking that one of the most popular shows on TV today draws from the same material that entertained crowds in the Bard's day, suggesting its timeless appeal. The famous line from Shakespeare's Henry IV Part II, Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Encapsulates a key focus in Game of Thrones as well. Power is never secure, just as no one ever sits comfortably on an iron throne made of sharp swords. You'll have to sit on the throne while I'm away. <laughs> You'll hate it more than I do. The takeaway from the Wars of the Roses and for Game of Thrones is that the greatness and rule these characters strive for can be lost in an instant. These people live at the top of society, with wealth and class superiority, yet they're insecure in their positions, and they live in fear for their lives. What good is power if you cannot protect the ones you love? Within the history of the Wars of the Roses, Henry Tudor shared some key similarities with Daenerys Targaryen's storyline. Tudor eventually emerged triumphant in the Wars of the Roses, so this could be a good omen for Danny. A direct descendant of the first Duke of Lancaster, he also claimed to be a descendant from King Arthur himself, just as Danny descends from a mythical figure, Aegon the Conqueror, who united six of the seven kingdoms and established the Iron Throne. Like Daenerys, Henry spent much of his early life in exile, and just as the Targaryens have a special connection to dragons and use it on their house sigil, Henry Tudor sometimes displayed Arthur's standard, a dragon. Tudor bridged an alliance with the Yorkists when he married Elizabeth of York, and his Tudor descendants ruled until 1603. If his story proves to be anything like Daenerys's, she may be able to claim the Iron Throne and bring peace to the Seven Kingdoms through a strategic marriage. Many fans would be happy if this were an alliance with her relative, Jon Snow. I will fight for you. I will fight for the North. When you bend the knee. A lot of us root for Daenerys because we aspire to see a victor who triumphs against unbelievable odds. Like Henry, she's an outsider who appears a long shot for the throne. And I will take what is mine. With fire and blood, I will take it but who represents to people a new form of rule and an end to the infighting. However, we've seen of late that Daenerys, like others before her, is finding the climb to power a slippery slope, and she risks losing track of the ideals that were easier to serve when she wasn't so close to claiming the throne she fervently desires. Bend the knee and join me. Together, we will leave the world a better place than we found it. 
or refuse and die. Although there's much debate on whether or not Henry Tudor was a great king, we know that he was a successful one. He strengthened the treasury and judicial system and left the monarchy secure and wealthy for his son. His history could imply that Daenerys will be a successful leader and affect some lasting change in the end. The other queen in the picture, Cersei Lannister channels iconic examples of the fallen or unfaithful woman from history and legend. She has a strikingly similar history to Margaret of Anjou, wife of Henry VI, who was defeated in the Wars of the Roses. Again, a good omen for Danny. Margaret had an unhappy arranged marriage like Cersei's to Robert Baratheon. Was it ever possible for us? Was there ever a time, ever a moment? No. Does that make you feel better or worse? It doesn't make me feel anything. And rumors swirled that her son Edward was illegitimate, just like Cersei's three children. Lena Headey even bears some resemblance to Margaret Anjou. Another historical character that Cersei can relate to is Anne Boleyn, who was charged with crimes of adultery, including sleeping with her own brother. Sound familiar? In Boleyn's case, though, the rumors might not have been true. They were more likely motivated by Henry VIII's desire to get rid of his second wife via beheading, which he did. Cersei also evokes the mythical queen Guinevere, who committed adultery with King Arthur's best knight, Lancelot. Like Cersei, Guinevere was sentenced to public humiliation, while the knightly Jaime is a twist on a Lancelot figure. Lena Headey actually played Guinevere in Merlin. Meanwhile, Cersei's walk of shame is also rooted in French medieval history. Adultery was punishable by the man and woman being roped together naked and forced to walk through town. Although Game of Thrones adds the fantastical element and exaggerates this kind of history, knowing that Cersei descends from these fallen women of history and legend who were vilified for their infidelity or sexual behavior makes the character all the more intriguing and real. And these connections help us understand why we're drawn to Cersei's character. Because while we're shocked by her ruthless nature, we sympathize with her as we realize she's a human underneath the many wounds she's lived through. We can't help but feel sorry for her when she fleetingly expresses vulnerability. She was nothing like me. No meanness, no jealousy, just good. I know. I thought if I could make something so good, so pure, maybe I'm not a monster. Just but she inevitably doubles down on her hard exterior shell. And with the fallen woman trope in mind, we all know what's coming for Cersei. The only question is when and how spectacular her final downfall will be. Ned Stark's fate was sealed much like Richard of York's fate. Richard of York was the closest advisor and trusted friend of Henry VI, just as Ned Stark was to Robert Baratheon. It's all fat for your armor. Fat? Fat, is it? Is that how you speak to your king? <laughs> the wife of Henry VI, Margaret, echoing Cersei, was distrustful of Richard and did everything in her power to keep York down. Later on, York was banished to Ireland, but he became protector of England, similar to Ned's title of Hand of the King. York eventually died at the hands of Margaret's armies. This real-life story reminds us that amidst the brutality, members of these warring houses did try to form bonds and alliances. We can all relate to the underlying realities of betrayals and friendships that were sacrificed to ambition. The Baratheon infighting takes after the story of Richard III, the son of that Richard of York that we just discussed, who was famously villainized by Shakespeare's play. Richard argued that his older brother Edward IV's sons were illegitimate and took the throne for himself. This reminds us of Stannis Baratheon, who argues, correctly in this case, that his nephews Joffrey and Tommen are illegitimate. The story of Richard III is evidence of how power rots families from within, causing not just cousins or friends, but brothers, uncles and nephews to war. Just like the Baratheons, historical family members have pitted themselves against each other in the name of seizing the crown. Interestingly, Ned Stark also has some comparisons to this Richard III, as a gruff northerner who was later vilified by the history written by the victors from the south. So the fact that contrasting accounts of this same historical person could partially inspire such divergent characters reminds us just how differently history is recorded by its winners versus its dissenters, and how little we can know for sure about past individuals. 
Someday, you'll sit on the throne and the truth will be what you make it. Martin has blended together multiple inspirations and mixed and matched histories in his characters to draw on the material that best serves his deeper themes. There are even more character echoes than what we've named here, but these crucial similarities from history tell us that Martin and the show creators aren't just copying entertaining details. They're looking at the deep lessons revealed by this history. It's hard to put a leash on a dog once you've put a crown on its head. The fact that these historical truths are as relevant as ever today tells us how little we tend to learn from our own history and how inevitably this history repeats again and again. If you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> this season of Game of Thrones may be coming to an end, but we're not. So subscribe to our channel for new Game of Thrones videos every Sunday.